Howdy, howdy. It's Tuesday, which means it's Semantics Day. Always exciting. Uh, today with me, I've got Joe Lammingman. Joe, good evening. Hi, Ben. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I am super excited about what we're about to do here today. We're going to be working on personalization stuff, which is something I understand you have quite a bit of experience in. Um, would you kind of tell the chat a bit about yourself, Joe? Yeah, so I'm um, Joe. I'm a web designer in York in England. And I've just finished a uh, MSc by research in interactive media at the University of York. And I sort of spent just over a year investigating whether we can use personalization as a tool for improving website accessibility. Good deal. Um, yeah, so I've just posted the link to uh, to follow Joe on Twitter, at Joe Lammingman. Um, absolutely do that. You, I know you've been blogging more, um, blogging some of the personalization stuff you've been doing, and, and this is a yeah. good place to uh, to get that. Yeah. That's right, yeah. So before we get started, what got you excited about accessibility and personalization? How did that start for you? Good question. Yeah, so I've been reading a few articles um, about accessibility and um, sort of a few contrasting viewpoints on it. Um, but I did sort of a year working for a company after I finished my undergraduate degree. And I've been doing a bit of accessibility testing with um, real users. And I was just looking for ways that we could make it a bit better. And I knew that like actual, um, the number of websites that are accessible is really, really poor. So that was like a motivator towards it. But then I also kind of like the theme of control and and I find that really interesting within interactive media. So I thought I'd sort of fuse the two together and and make a degree sort of looking at that. So that's where it came from, really. Okay, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, all right, well, uh, I know that you have kind of actually prepped up a bit of an introduction to this kind of personalization stuff. So uh, let's go ahead and, and dive into that. Um, cool. Take it away, Joe. Thanks. Um, so yeah, it's called Personalizing User Interfaces for Accessibility. Um, and just to start off with, I, I thought I'd quickly define two of the key terms that I'll be I'll be using um, during this stream. Um, so on this first slide, we're going to have uh, two definitions on screen, and the first is uh, website accessibility. Um, so you can see here on screen, um, it says that well, the way I've defined it is that ensuring that websites can be used by as many people as possible and that nobody's excluded. And the definition of web accessibility should also recognize that it's not static, like it can change depending on where you are, like your health, the environment that you're in. Um, I think it's important because when we talk about accessibility, sometimes some people can think of it only related to like conformance to a certain level of the web content accessibility guidelines. So yeah, I like to think of it as sort of this dynamic thing that changes depending on where we are or how we're feeling or the environment we're in. Um, I think that's important. And then the second one, which is obviously important for a stream on personalization, is um, the term personalization. The way I've defined it, as you can see on screen, it's employed in relation to the action of an individual customizing an object. That can be either physically or digitally in order to align with their individual needs and goals. Um, so it's not, the way I'm defining it isn't as like some data driven thing. Um, it's specifically somebody who's tailoring something to meet their own needs. Um, they're not doing it like, for a political statement or like as part of a joke or a meme, it's all about making sure that whatever they're using meets their specific access needs. So this is me going into my settings and then saying I want captions enabled or I need larger text or better color. Yeah, yeah, it's absolutely that. Yeah, it's not something doing it for you um, because of the way you're using your device. It's, it's you explicitly doing it for yourself. Gotcha. Yeah. Cool. Um, so the, the next slide is titled uh, CAG shortcomings. So we're going to be looking at some of the shortcomings of the web content accessibility guidelines. And um, if you're not familiar, I, I guess uh, most of you will be, but yeah, the guidelines provide the criteria that developers must meet to help make uh, websites, games, media accessible to as many people as possible. And the guidelines are created with specific disabilities in mind. Um, and again, for example, if you're, if you're not familiar with the guidelines, there's specific criteria that relate to um, how you can make uh, interactive media accessible for somebody who's navigating with a screen reader or um, a keyboard. And um, the guidelines aren't designed to meet the needs of individuals who have varying degrees of disabilities or different combinations of disabilities. So as it says on screen at the minute, 
Uh, this is a quote taken from the introduction. Um, Although these guidelines cover a wide range of issues, they're not able to address the needs of people with all types, degrees, and combinations of disability. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm not trying to like, you know, say that uh, WCAG's over or that don't worry about WCAG because it's still a really important fundamental. And my work's just sort of ex exploring uh, that gap that they, they identified themselves. Um, and just seeing if there's anything more we can do to just, just help make the experiences a bit more accessible. Um, so, yeah. Absolutely. So, um, the area I was specifically looking at um, was e commerce because I was aware of terrible statistics, uh, such as the one that's on screen at the minute. It says out of 30 Australian e commerce websites that were tested, only ASOS met the minimum success criteria for WCAG 2.0 level A, uh, which is the lowest level. And these findings align with the WebAIM 2019 report where 98.8% of websites did not meet WCAG 2.1 AA criteria. Um, so yeah, only one of these e-commerce websites met the very fundamental level of accessibility conformance, which is in its own pretty bad, um, but even more so on the next slide. Within e-commerce, we have all these dark UX patterns. Um, so on screen at the moment is a screenshot from like a room booking user interface where um, there's lots of like a green on the screen, like green ticks next to random amenities, like a toaster or a bathtub, stuff like that. Um, but uh, we also have two sort of bright red bold bits of text. And in those bright red bits of text, we're informed that only six rooms are left and another person's looked for similar dates in the last 10 minutes. Um, so yeah, it's quite a, quite contrasting against the, the bright green ticks and check marks. And these are sort of the dark UX patterns that I'm sure we've all encountered at some point or another. And yeah, they, they're commonplace within the e-commerce industry. Um, I was reading a study that found out of 11,000 e-commerce sites, 632 contained low stock messages and 393 contained countdown timers. And these patterns really are like the antithesis of the web content accessibility guidelines because they aim to like evoke an emotional reaction. Um, they're preying on people's access needs in order to convert a potential purchase. Um, so yeah, pretty terrible to be honest. Um, so yeah, the, the two of them, both inaccessible websites and then dark UX patterns makes for a pretty bleak, bleak picture for e-commerce websites. Um, and then in addition to that, on the next slide, sorry to be so negative at the minute, um, we've got in, increasing context of use, and this isn't so negative, but um, I guess we're sort of living through a period of time where we've got this increasingly expanding uh, set of technology that, that we're using. So um, the first point on screen at the minute states that web browsers are on smart devices, which is true. So um, there's a, a meme going around on Twitter of somebody like watching shrek on their fridge and there's web browsers on um apple watches and smart watches so yeah they're, they're everywhere and it just means for like there's, there's this constantly expanding um context of use and i woke up one morning to uh, my brother who sent me a video of him viewing one of my websites on a nintendo 3ds handheld console and I was like, that is crazy. I could never have predicted a website being viewed on a, a device like that. Um, so yeah, and then uh, the next point on the screen at the minute um, is how sort of these smart devices are facilitating, facilitating interactions in new environments. So, um, you know, you could be viewing a website on your watch while walking down the street, or um, you could be viewing something on a different smart device while you're in a really bustling environment. Um, and as developers working with typically higher end machines in office environments, um, it raises the question, which is the last point stated on the screen, like how can we develop for these? How can we understand how to make experiences accessible throughout all these different contexts? Um, which is a, a really difficult question um, because it's hard enough sometimes making a website, um, you know, work for different devices, let alone different contexts. So onto um, the, the last slide, really, I think this is where personalization comes in. Because when used correctly, as stated in the first point on screen at the moment, it allows for individuals to customize a website to meet their own individual needs. And um, it comes at a time where thankfully we've got CSS custom properties and we can change styling and we can change designs really, really quickly without the need for you know, complex libraries 
or um, tons of frameworks. You know, it's, it's pretty straightforward um, in comparison to how it's been in the past. So, yeah, we can we can provide a user with a different design with just a few different custom properties. I think personalization is really good as well because it's similar to uh, what you mentioned on the stream last week, Ben, when you were talking about curb cuts. Um, because I think like personalization could help people who maybe don't identify as having a disability themselves. Um, but yeah, they realize that by making the, I don't know, the text bigger or by changing the layout of something, they can make it more accessible to themselves. Um, so yeah, and then I guess the final point on this as well is I think personalization is, is really important um, because I think it should be done by the user themselves. So I've read a series of different papers um, where people have tried to build automatic solutions um, and they don't tend to be uh, they don't tend to be successful for a couple reasons. Um, the first is that maybe they don't really tackle the user's need. They don't really like create something that that meets the user's needs um, because they're trying to grab a load of data and like automatically create something. Um, and the second reason is like they're not sustainable long term. So there's one piece I was reading where they would get users of a website to come in for like a load of physical in-person tests to then go away again and use a website which was now like personalized to their needs. Um, so yeah, again, just not sustainable, really overly complex um, for something that's not really addressing the user's needs. Um, so yeah, so, so that brings us, oh sorry. No, go ahead, go ahead, Jeff. I was going to say it brings us nicely onto um, the question like, Great. We know we know that we want to use personalization now, but how do we know what to personalize? And uh, yeah, that's why I built the, the Bob Roll Business Builder, which I think a lot of people have seen on Twitter and may be familiar with. Um, and essentially what it is, is it's a, an interactive study to sort of help me understand this very question. It allows people to step by step create their own toilet roll shop design by selecting different options within the user interface. Um, so yeah, we could we could take a, a quick look at it. Yeah. Um, um, and and full disclosure, I took the survey a couple months ago when it was actually like open and when you were collecting, and it's super super fascinating stuff. So I'm just going to go uh, ahead and check all these boxes. But um, I put the link in the chat. Please go through and, and do this yourself. I I think you'll be amazed kind of what what you learn. Um, can you walk us through this, Joe? Yeah, sure. So on the left of the screen, uh, what we've got is sort of like. The site that you're creating so at the minute it's blank because we haven't really selected anything and then on the right of the screen we've got a series of different options so at the minute it's asking us like how big do you want your font to be and you can sort of choose t-shirt sizes like small medium large or larger and as ben clicks on something the font size on the left in the browser display or the, the design display um, is changing sizes depending on the option that's been clicked on so then once you're happy you can select next question and sort of step by step you start to create your design. Um, and the really cool thing about this is that the design on the left that Ben's changed at the minute is semantic HTML. So it's not like a picture or anything. Um, it's not like a canvas that's inaccessible. If you're a screen reader user or a keyboard user, you can actually tab through the design on the left, check that it works for you, and you can like play it out and test it and um, make sure that it, it actually makes sense. So these options on the right semantically changing the content on the left um, which i think is a really interesting approach to survey design like actually letting somebody play around with something and, and check it works for them so yeah and as you as you go through i think there's I think there's nine different options in the end for stuff you had to choose um, but it's all kind of like the, the fundamentals of a product page so like additional information um, where the image sits um, kind of the element that you use to pick your sizes or quantity. Um, so yeah, nine different options. And then at the end, um, it lets you, it shows you what you've created, but it, like compares it against the most frequently selected stuff as well. So you get to see like what other people have built too. Um, so yeah, it's just a, a really interesting product and a really interesting um, survey. And yeah, it was it was really, really cool. When I started out to do it, I didn't think it was gonna end up as, as good as it, as it did, but yeah, I'm really, really chuffed to bits with it. So as you as you got the results from this, and I know you were kind of trying a whole bunch of different things to get information, uh, what surprised you from this? Uh, good question. Um, I think that the best thing that came out of this was I found that, I think it was 
roughly 91% of participants said that the designs that they created met their own needs, which was really, really cool because with the questions, I kind of like asked for that kind of information. I, I kind of asked them to personalize it, but I hadn't like explicitly said, make this how you see fit. It's like, what do you think works best? And to hear that that many people found that it met their own needs was really, really cool. Um, and to me, like starts to starts to highlight that people are able to personalize stuff because I think that was a big question in existing academia. Like, are people able to personalize websites? And I think this kind of goes some way to saying that, yeah, people can personalize their own websites, which was, yeah, really, really interesting. Um, See, so yeah, on this screen, if before it like showed you your website on the left and then there was a contextual questionnaire on the right so I could understand information about people's disabilities or um, current like website browsing habits, that kind of thing. Um, and then there's like a link which takes you through to a comparison. Um, so you could see what other people have made as well. Mm, this, so this is, this comparison is new. It's, it's new since the survey finished is what you're saying. Uh, the comparison itself is like always updating. So yeah, it'll be, it'll be up to date and, and yeah, you can see the most frequently selected options. Um, I don't know, it's nice, it like lets people, I don't know, it's like giving something back, I guess. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's also really interesting to go through and be like, how have people picked that? <laughs> so yeah, it's cool. Yeah, um, and I'm also thinking like, like I'm, I'm immediately thinking of how contextual even my choices were, oops, um, how contextual even my, my choices were because um, I selected like these these radio buttons I think had this been Amazon and I were purchasing like a, a shirt, like I would want to see pictures of the shirt, right? I sure. like that. That's more concrete to me than uh, like as a need than um, just radio buttons with text names. Um, like is red maroon? Is it like bright red? What is what does that mean? Um, yeah. So I like even even just kind of with this context, like I even have more questions now. Yeah, uh, on the, the subject of, of this whole survey, uh, Michael Chan says, I love the whimsy of doing this for toilet paper, not intimidating. So it seems like you got a good you, you got a good choice. How did you land on toilet paper? Yeah, so I think I was starting this project roughly about, like specifically starting working on this website about a year ago, which would have been sort of just into the pandemic where we didn't really have any toilet paper in the UK. Oh. And it was all being sold out. So I was like, oh, this will capture people's attention. <laughs> And it was also the kind of time when um, quite a few people were talking about like the whimsical web. Um, so yeah, it was exactly for, for that reason. I thought, you know, it's something that will break up um, people's doom scrolling. So you'll come across this on Twitter instead of another yeah. terrible post. And yeah, it's a bit fun, so. Whereas like, I think had you gone like the t-shirt route, people immediately would have like gone, well, I use Amazon and therefore, right. like, or I use Walmart or something like that, right? And therefore I'm gonna pick the choices that line up with this. Um, using toilet paper, I don't know about you, but I don't purchase toilet paper online. Um, so using toilet paper kind of like, it makes it concrete, but also takes it kind of out of any context that people are already familiar with. That's a, a really strong fit. Holy cow. Yeah. So yeah, it was, it was really, really cool. It ended up being like a massive part of my master's, but, um, I didn't really even think about that much to begin with. So <laughs> yeah, it's really, really cool. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a few cool comments as well, like um, somebody put that based on the design they created, um, they normally needed glasses to read information on websites, but because mm -hmm. they've been able to change their text size and that, um, they felt that they they were able to read it without their glasses, which I think thought was mm -hmm. cool because it goes back to that like contextual use where, you know, you might have forgotten your glasses or you might not, you might be in a situation where you can't wear glasses. So to be able to do that, um, it's really handy. Um, so yeah. I'm also looking at this and going, oh, the size I picked was identified as large, and it's larger than the average. Maybe I need new glasses. <laughs> oh, 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 yeah, maybe I could uh, sort of rebundle it into a, a tool for, for doing sight tests. Uh, <laughs> yes, so good. <laughs> um, so, yeah, and then the, the sort of, I, I went through and analyzed all the results from this. So I looked at the options that people have picked the frequency um, that the answers have been selected. And I found that 
for people that didn't identify as having a disability because we grouped them into people who did identify as having a disability and people who didn't mm -hmm. for those that didn't we found that there, there tended to be like a more frequently selected option like a, a front runner that most people agreed on so for like tech size i think most people agreed on the medium or large but for the group of participants that had identified as having a disability for seven out of the nine features in the design um, there was no like most frequently selected option there was like quite a, a fairly even spread across the answers and yeah i think i think it's interesting because um it kind of illustrates that like this is a group of people who, who have wider who have a wider range of different access needs um so yeah that, that's also gone some way to making me think that maybe personalization is a good fit um for web accessibility awesome um, so if I were looking to get started with personalization for accessibility, how might I, how might I get started? What, what might I need to keep in mind perhaps? Uh, so I guess just sort of knowing a bit of information about, um, sort of different disabilities and different, different people's needs is a really good thing to think about. So, um, I should have put it in the resources on the slides, but, um, I think it's the UK government. Um, the digital services put out a few posters on like do's and don'ts when designing for accessibility and um, it's sort of a really clear way of seeing what you should and shouldn't be doing when um, you're designing for, for different people and it sort of says really really clearly on the left um, like here's some things you should do and then here's some things you shouldn't do um, sorry i didn't realize it was hidden away in this, yeah, this GitHub. That's... Okay. Uh, let's see if this works. Oh, it, oh, there we go. Yeah, Look at that. Yeah. So, yeah. So for users on the autistic spectrum, um, some of it's like make sure you've got like a really clear layout. Don't like put loads of stuff together and make really busy designs. Make sure it's really clear. Um, and this is really handy because you can start to under understand some needs, and um, you can start to get an idea as to how you should be personalizing stuff. So um, I've got a few sort of starter files. Um, so if you want to have a go at yeah. starting to personalize a website, um, there's a repository here on GitHub. I also don't think I put this on my resource slide, but um, I can share the link and update the slides. <laughs> um, so it's basically just a few HTML CSS files. There's a little bit of JavaScript that does sort of the class adding and class removing. Um, but I think it's a, a good base to start from. And I think on the site by default, if we have a quick look at that. On the... So uh, just within a browser. Yes. NPM start for browser change, isn't it? There we go. That's right. Uh, oh, it's port 3000. Okay. There we ah. go. More bog rolls. Um, Heck yeah. <laughs> so I've, I've tried to theme it around the bog roll. I'm trying to stick to the theme, no. really. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> There we go. Beautiful. Um, How did I not get you on this stream earlier? This is incredible. <laughs> uh, so on the left, I think one of the like most common personalizations that we have. So on the screen at the minute, um, we've got like a site that's got a few different things going on. It's laid out with a grid. So we've got a header and footer on the left of the screen. And on the right is like the, the main body of our, of our website that we can scroll through. But the most common personalization I think we're all used to seeing now is like change into a dark theme. Um, so you should have a working light theme, dark theme switcher on the site. Um, and I think we've, yeah, like I said, we, we're all used to it now. Um, but I think it's a really good thing to think about when moving forwards and looking at personalizations. Um, so I thought what we'd have a go at first is trying to make a personalization that changes the structure of the website itself. So at the minute, like I said, there's a grid going on, there's some flex boxes. But what if we just wanted like a single column, like streamlined layout? Um, so together, hopefully, we'll be able to, to code that in. So looking at the code, um, if you've ever looked at Cube CSS um, by Andy Bell, it's sort of structured like that. So I've got a SCSS file that has um, all the sort of Cube CSS bits in it. The uh, link to this. This oh. is a, a way to like structure your your CSS uh, by Andy Bell. Um, That's right. That focuses on kind of the best parts of the cascade. Uh, That's there you it, go. yeah. Yeah, um, so my SCSS folder is structured like that. So we've got the composition, the utilities, 
blocks, and I haven't got any exceptions in here at the minute. Um, but the additional bit is the personalizations folder. So I guess it's like QP or something like that, PCube. <laughs> that doesn't sound too great, but uh, oh. we'll work on the name. We'll fix it. <laughs> also, not a problem that's well addressed by bog rolls. Or, or maybe <laughs> totally a problem that's well addressed by bog rolls. Okay. Um, uh, all on brand still. Um, so, yeah, already in here, I put in the themes um, SCSS. And um, this themes SCSS is sort of based on a uh, post or a tutorial that Andy Bell did. And I've sort of heavy, heavily referenced that um, to get the theme stuff working. So I don't know, could we open them side by side? Because it, it might help us when we're making the layout structure. Uh, like open the, the browser and the editor side by side? Ah, no, sorry. Could we open the uh, themes SCSS um, file uh, and the yeah. layout structure SCSS side by side? Yeah. Let's do that. And then open this in here. Ah, Class perfect. sidebar. There we go. How's that? Cool. Yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is, as we can see on the left here, we need to, to make some um, properties that we'll be able to grab, and we need to make sure that there's some default set. So on the left, we've got our HTML selector. So we're selecting the HTML attribute. Um, and if the user prefers the dark color scheme, then we automatically set the color mode to dark. Otherwise, um, we have another HTML selector, and we just set the color mode to light. Um, by default. So if the user doesn't have a preference and they haven't selected anything, maybe it's their first time visiting the site, um, we're just going to show them the, the light mode by default. Um, so that's how it works. And then sort of around line 19, um, we then declare all the light properties so they can actually reference something. Um, so they're all there. And then line 28, we declare all the, the dark properties. So now they're all declared. That's brilliant, but they're not going to do anything. So on line 37, um, we're just using a bit of SAS so that when the HTML has a p dash light class attached to it, we set all the color properties to be their light variants. And then, likewise, on line 48, when we have a dark class on the HTML element, we're setting all the color properties um, to be their dark variants. So, yeah, you're essentially just switching which properties are being used based on the class that's applied to the HTML element. So, it's pretty simple, I think. All right. And then we're going to try and do that to make sort of a, a straightforward layout structure on the right. Um, so what we're going to do is start off by creating some defaults. Um, so if we create a property called um, maybe like layout structure dash grid. But does this need, this does need, oh, it's in HTML. Yes, layout structure. Dash grid. Got it. Perfect. And for now, we won't set it to be anything for, for the time being. We'll jump back to that in just a second. And then we're going to do the same. We're going to make a layout structure dash flex. Cool. OK. And then we're going to do like we've done on the left. Um, the next thing we did was to declare sort of the light properties. So what we're going to do in our layout structure is we're going to sort of now create our CSS custom properties that are going to handle sort of the structured properties. It might sound a bit weird, but when we start doing it in a second, I think it'll become a bit clearer. Um, so what we're going to do here is going to create essentially the same custom property name, so layout structure grid, but we're going to add on to the end of it dash structured. I think that makes sense. And we're going to set it to be grid because when we're in structured view, we want it to di display grids. And then essentially just the same for flex boxes. Maybe I will just uh, copy paste, huh? That there we go. Faster. Don't need to show off my Mavis speaking training. <laughs> um, it's uh, Streamlined is the other one. I think. Yep. Or, or maybe Flex. Oh, no. It's, it, there we go. We yep. can, yeah, we can, we can do um, that one. Um, but if we're doing layout structure grid streamlined, then for now, what we're going to do is set that one to be block. Um, so what this is doing, we've got our grid structured. So when we have a grid, 
and the user wants the page to be structured properly, we're going to show it as a grid. But when the user wants it to be streamlined, we're going to switch that property to be block because um, this CSS custom property is going to be used for the display property within CSS. So yeah, when it's structured, it'll be grid. And then when it's streamlined, it'll just snap to a block and then everything will just be in a nice streamlined column. Super cool. Um, um, and then, yeah. there we go. perfect. Yeah. Um, and then we can, should we do flexboxes or should we stick? Let's just get the grid one working sure. for the time being. Um, so yeah, then below, um, I guess it's line 13 at the minute, we're going to make it so that when the HTML element has a specific class attached. Um, so you've been so, following this P and that, that P is for personalization, I'm guessing? Yeah, I, I think that's what I decided <laughs> decided on all, all those right. months back. Case layout structure grid is going to be set yep. to. It's going to be set to yeah, that exactly that. Okay, I'm getting the hang of this. This is making cool. sense to me. Uh, and then we'll create our other class, which will be for when it's streamlined. So we're we're saying when when our HTML has the P structured class, it's going to uh, set the layout structure grid variable to be this guy, which is grid. And otherwise, when it has the P streamlined class, it's going to set it to this guy, which is block. So we can yes. we can toggle between grid and block this way based on which exactly. class is applied. Very cool. Exactly that. Yeah. And then the only other thing that's left to do right now at the minute is on line three, we just need to set. Our layout structure grid to like a sensible default so we can set it to um, the variable which is layout structure grid structured sure. um, because that'll be grid. Um, so by default when the user hasn't visited the site or set a preference they'll, they'll still get the structured grid. So yeah that's perfect that's all our SCSS stuff done. Um, the only other thing we need to do now is in our index.html of the site I did uh, a bit of work earlier. So within the footer. In the footer, which would be all the way down here. Okay. Yeah, perfect. Um, so you can see there's a there's a field set there um, and there's a legend asking, how would you prefer the layout? Um, mm. So we've got an input and a label. And within the input, I think there's a data attribute. Uh, yeah, there we go. Data dash class to add. So if you change, um, the, the whatever's in there at the minute yeah so if you just replace that with the class name that you made which i think was p dash and then this would be p streamlined down here for that i think so so if we save this and give it a go i don't think we've missed anything i think we should be able to personalize the layout of our site it is my my browser has decided to play a different oh, no. game let's see Does that do it okay so styling options and then yeah. layout and then so where would i expect to see is is the well i guess it's on the html so where if i set structured nothing should change because that was the default but when i set streamlined oh no nothing changed <laughs> hmm. so if we take another look at it um so what should have happened is inside my css wherever i've been um Oh, I know what it is. Um, yeah, so if we jump to the critical.scss uh, file. Yeah, I'm guessing because I picked a different class name than you had. No, you've, oh. you've done it exactly right. I just missed the step. So okay. um, the way it's working at the minute is, uh, and I guess it's a, a really important thing I should have mentioned earlier. When it comes to personalization, I think it's really easy to personalize most properties. It just depends how easy it is for you to abstract, like, commonly used values out of the code. So instead of doing display grid in my code, I've done display and then set it to be the custom property, which I've called display grid. So um, that's currently managing all the grid stuff. All we need to do is just do like a find and replace wherever display grid is used and um, change it to that custom property that you created earlier. Display grid. Uh, sorry, it'll be um, dash dash oh, display dash grid. Yeah.
and then I think the I can't remember the custom property you made. Was it dash dash structure? For the layout structure ah, grid. That's it. Yeah, that's the property. Okay. Yeah. So we're gonna use this. Um, yeah, probably we'll, don't we'll need to able... set it up here because it's already set. But we'll. That's it. Zoom it here, and yep. then probably do this on all the other. That's right. Cash files. Uh, I think that's the CSS that's compiled, oh, so okay. it should be fine there. It's like it's just one over there. All right. So yeah, now we've actually given it the custom properties to use. Hey, hey presto, we get like a single column layout. So because we sort of abstracted all all those properties into a single custom property, we just change it one place, and then yeah, okay, it's but... pretty. I'm clicking structured and it's not taking me back. Oh no. Also, I think I saw this when I went to dark mode. Uh, light mode's not taking me back either. But I think like oh. that's the general like the the general idea makes sense. Oh look at that. Wild. Now that's probably to do with my JavaScript because I'll put my hands up and I am not the best JavaScript developer in the right. world. CSS is more re my remit, so it's like it was working sure. up a bit at the minute, but works on my machine. Um, yeah, there we go. Um, so yeah, it could definitely do with being improved. Um, but yeah, the, that's sort of the sort of fundamentals of it. Um, it should sort of just snap back between the two um, because of those properties. So yeah, I'm, I'm not sure uh, what's happening at the minute. Let's see. Let's check the yeah. the errors. See if see anything in there. All right. Oh, good on you. Love these console logs. This is great. So it doesn't look like there's anything too wrong. Um, let me think. Hmm. No, I'm 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 not entirely sure. Um, yeah, because we changed everything so that it should be using layout structure grid, and then yeah. should we jump back to the layout structure .scss file and just yes. check that again? Layout structure. Yep. Yep. Um, so, yeah, it should be using dash stream, streamlined, and then it should be using dash structured. Huh. Dash structured be dash streamlined. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure. Uh, what's causing that? Data class to add. Dash structured. Yeah, that that one looks right to me. Global. Global. Joe, I found your JavaScript. I found oh, where the no. secrets lie. <laughs> what you um, unleashed upon everybody. <laughs> all right. Uh, so it's looking specifically for light and dark and not P light and P dark. Uh, yeah, and that might be because of the way it was saved. In the browser, was it even changing the class on the HTML element? I guess it wouldn't have been. Out. Um, right now, because I refreshed, did that change anything? No, I guess it's yeah, it's, it's doing the local storage part, right? Uh, so it's stored as p dash p dash structured. That's the problem. Um, see the class on the HTML element. I don't know why it's done that, and it's never done that before. But there you okay. go. Maybe I won't just search for p dash. Um. Ah, look at that. It's uh, so you're you're appending it here. So I need to go. The, what I need to do is go back here, and uh, of course, yeah. There we go. There we go. I think I think that should get us there. So change to dark theme. Change. Well, we'll see if that works uh, <laughs> later, perhaps. Um, structured layout. No, still not happy. It's P dark P and P structured though. Yeah. Hmm. hmm. Yeah, I'm. I'm not sure. I have to take another look at that and dive into into my horrible JavaScript again. Um. But yeah, I guess the I guess sort of the the intent is there. Um. And and using that, you should sort of have a quick way to switch between the two. Um. But there's sort of a, another another side to this. So that's sort of meant to be the global personalization side. 
but then, then I was looking at individual personalizations as well. So we should be able to, to still work through this. So um, if we go to the, maybe the, one of the bundle pages. One of the bundle um, pages, okay. And if you scroll down and hover over the product overview stuff. Uh, okay. Oh, look at um, that. Yeah, you get like a little change the styling thing that pops up. So like if you focused, you'd be able to hit that still. So it is reachable by keyboard. Um, and you should be able to, well, once we've um once we've coded it up, if my JavaScript still still holds, we'll be able to change the font size and line height of this specific element, which I think is really cool as well, because like there might be aspects on a site where um, you know, they're, they're more relevant to you and you just want to be able to see them or change the way that, that the font's currently laid out. Um, sometimes when reading articles, I, I go into the CSS myself and change it. So mm -hmm. I was thinking, like, is there a way that we could make it so you can target specific elements? Um, like you might want to get rid of adverts or something. or Yeah, just make bump up the size of, of additional yeah. information. Um, so, yeah, these are what I've been calling my individual personalizations. And the way they work is just by using um, utility classes. So if you click on font size, it will show you like a similar thing to what we had before, okay. um, where it will tell you, sorry, it will ask you what text size you want to select. And then, yeah, you'll be able to just go in and yeah, cycle through them. Um, so that's working. And I didn't think that would work at this stage. So that's interesting as well. <laughs> <laughs> I know we code this up together. But um, yeah, the, the way this is working is, again, it's pretty similar, I think. On each of those uh, radio attributes, you've just got like a data property or data class to add. It's just a data attribute. And I'm using some JavaScript just to apply that to this specific element. I've stored the selector in local storage. So it targets it and then applies it to it. So we've set it to extra large here. But you can imagine that on a website, like the product page might just be a template that you, you just fill with data again and again. So because this is stored in local storage with a selector, Fingers crossed, you should be able to go to any other bundle page and your personalization should have held, like Ooh. the product overview should be large. Oh, yeah. look at that. Okay, that's super cool. So then you've got your personalizations that stick with you as you sort of progress through the site and do whatever on the site. Um, so I think that's nice. And then one of the things I was looking at, I don't know if the, the code will work based on what's happened so far, but yeah. You can clearly, um, sorry, you can very quickly like clear those personalizations. I think that was important as well. And it's not, I'll oh, see if it works. Where, um, where is that at? Is that... So it should be inside oh. there. Okay. Ah, and so it... small. All right. So that bit works. <laughs> um, and yeah, in my, uh, in the, the website I created for my thesis, which is separate to this, I had like a, a button where you could stop those dialogues from appearing because you can imagine if you were constantly going through this site, it would get a bit frustrating if they kept popping up. Um, so yeah, and I was changing quite a few things as well. So there's like line height, word spacing, um, maybe the width of the element. If you if the um, width was getting too big, you could say it's like a specific amount of characters um, using like the, the CH measurements, I guess. Um, so that was quite handy too. Um, so there's a whole host of things you can explore, but I think those um, gov.uk posters are a good starting point to think like, oh, what, what's a feature of my design that I could personalize? And then, yeah, using sort of global stuff and then more specific individual personal personalizations, um, you can actually make these changes. I think it's a, a cool way to do it. So I didn't actually get to test this method um, with too many people. I tested it with uh, a single screen reader user. Um, so that their experience definitely isn't like going to be the same um, for everybody. But yeah, they, they said that the individual personalization menus were easy to hit. They were in like an appropriate space and they work quite well for them. But again, just one person. So um, could be terrible for others. Um, but yeah, I think it's a really interesting way to think about it. And, you know, you could imagine making these changes quite quickly and having a site that looks quite different from how designers or developers thought it was going to look in the first place. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it sounds like a lot of the uh, customizations that you're making have have to do with typography and with colors and layout. So very very visual stuff. Um, so did those um, kinds of attributes end up being like really compelling personalizable attributes? And did did you find anything else that people might not have thought of in that regard that might be personalized? 
I guess all the visual stuff was kind of what you'd expect. Um, so yeah, it was mainly to do with topography, um, some elements with spacing, maybe there was some layout stuff like we've explored um, and that we're now stuck with. Um, but one of the things I tried as well was um, introducing like expanded alt text and also providing oh. like hidden page descriptions for screen reader users. So instead of like, uh, I don't know if, if everybody's familiar, but screen reader users will have shortcuts so they can quickly explore the headings on the page, and that's how they'll understand information about the page. So I thought maybe we could have like a hidden page summary at the top to understand if that was useful. And the, the screen reader user I spoke to said that these features were really interesting and the expanded alt text was um, was really good for them. But like the, the page summary stuff that was hidden at the top of the page, they said, Maybe they wouldn't use it because the heading shortcut is is a lot quicker and, and they don't mm -hmm. they know what to expect with it. You know, like not all sites are going to have a hidden page summary. So that wasn't too useful. Um, but interestingly, they said that if they were if they were at the stage where they were just picking up a screen reader and they weren't used to all the commands, oh. these kind of features would be really useful for helping people sort of understand what's on a page if they don't know all those key bindings and, and shortcuts. So I thought that was really, really interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Are there more things you wanted to try out, Joe? Um, let's have a look. We've done some, I guess we could quickly look at how the utility classes are structured. Um, and there's, there's nothing really too special about these. Um, but in my utilities folder, um, I think there's a ah, font size is perfect. So yeah, these are these are again just using CSS custom properties, and I've got some utility classes for setting like size eight hundred, size seven hundred. But then again, I've gone for like the t-shirt sizing sort of thing, where we've got text size small, medium, large, and extra large, and these are literally just what's been applied to that additional information. I've made it important. Um, normally, I feel a bit a bit naughty when I use the the important bit, but I feel like utility class is fine. So. Mm -hmm. Um, well, and especially because these represent user preferences, like those user preferences, uh, those user preferences should win out over anything the designer was trying to do. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. So in this case, it, it feels it feels right to do it, although it doesn't look good to have like five importance on the screen, <laughs> but I feel like it works. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, and, and this is literally just all that's being applied to, to that additional information. So. Yeah, again, nothing nothing too complex. Um, it's just sort of like existing CSS stuff that we already have in order to make these personalizations um, with my JavaScript that doesn't work. <laughs> but, sure. Yeah. But I think the I think the general idea is there of like your when you're writing your layouts and, and your designs in CSS, you're using custom properties and those custom properties are changed based on uh, what class is applied to the HTML or to the specific element. And the user has controls where they can choose, hey, I want this font size or I want this layout. And those controls have a bit of JavaScript to toggle the class on that element. So it toggles the class, which reassigns the custom properties, um, which changes the layout, which is super cool. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I think it's uh, I think it's really interesting, and I was kind of trying to think about it within the context of like design systems as well, because okay. if you abstracted everything out early enough, um, it'd be quite straightforward to add in personalization. I guess you might have a bit more testing. Um, there might be sort of a bit to do with like reassuring your marketing teams that this is actually really important. Um, but yeah, I think I think that would be really interesting just to see users' preferences like propagate through a massive design system, um, which would be really, really cool. Uh, so yeah, it's interesting. There's, there's lots to think about off the back of this, but mm -hmm. I think it's a, a good start. All right. Let me see if I can fix the, the theme switcher. Could this, oh, here's your local uh, storage theme... stuff. Yeah, the theme signature is, is pretty much Andy Bell's stuff. So all of my stuff is within global styling changes and individual styling right. changes. By the way, have you seen, I believe it's Max Buck, um, his theme switcher on his, his site? This is glorious. Uh, I think it's mxb.dev. This is so good. Yes. Uh, friends dropping this in the, the chat is mm. worth a check. But um, 
he takes this to the extreme here. Um, you can click this, and then you can pick like, oh, you know, I'm 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 a oh, Dark wow. Moon fan. Uh, you know, I've I've got like he's got all these other themes here that are all named wow. after Mario Kart courses. Uh, <laughs> lobsters, if you need more lobsters. Um, oh, suddenly it's happening. Yeah, just lots of really fun gosh. stuff. So you you can apply this to extremes in some yeah. way. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. So yeah, essentially that's that's all um, personalization is. But yeah, just building on that a little bit. But yeah, this is uh, incredible. Yeah. I see you get the the little lobster cursor as well. Yes, um, and the font <laughs> changes to lobster. Lobster. <laughs> um, wow. Yeah. So, uh, and this is this is I believe um, it just kind of taking what what you've done here of like toggling the the classes um, to toggle the custom properties it's yeah. taking it to um a bit of an extreme in some way and i love it yeah it's pretty um and i believe this is an 11d site joe so oh so we go, we represent this is personalization and 11d this is this is definitely my kind of site um yeah so let's let's see yeah, so here's where you're adding the class, the HTML element. Are you... Do you remove the class? Yes. I, there's some s split in and some some string editing at some point. I, I can't really remember off the top of my head exactly where it is. Um, because for for some... I think if I've... If I've added the class from local storage, I think I was doing it differently at one point, and then I tried to like combine the two, and that's probably where it got a bit messy. Yeah. Um, because yeah, a lot of this code was written in like a panicked state, worrying about deadlines and oh, no. testing. Oh, it's okay. Um, yeah. no, it's okay. So yeah, I, I kind of like just buried all of that knowledge of this code, and now it's it's, it's reemerged. <laughs> <laughs> Might have to play around with this, see what we can see what we can make. Um, okay, so what? Yeah. What avenues do you think personalization should explore going going forward? Whether that's you or whether that's just people, web accessibility uh, uh, advocates who are interested in exploring personalization. Where can personalization go from here? Oh, I'd love to see, like, I think there's a few things I'd love to see. I'd love to see, like, design systems or maybe CSS frameworks starting to include personalization by default. Um, so I think... There's a there's a library I can't quite remember the name of it I think it's something like Full Moon um, which is a CSS uh, framework similar to like Bootstrap but I think that's got like a light and dark modes which are built in by default. Um, uh, full Half Moon maybe Full Moon Half Moon UI. We'll we'll find out. Uh, ooh. Does yeah. Look familiar. Oh, we got there. Moon. Yeah. What's half that? Moon UI. Um, I think by default, yeah, they have light dark mode switcher, and it'd be cool to see more of that built in by default, like to allow people to change font sizes. And I appreciate some of this is done um, within browser settings, but I don't think a lot of people know this kind of stuff exists or yeah. like system settings. So I think making it easier to to discover and change is is really useful. Yes, um, Tatiana Mack had an article very recently about prefers reduced motion, which mm. um, is the kind of browser operating system level setting that um, basically the user can express their preference for whether they want to see animations or uh, whether they prefer not to, um, which can be incredibly important, for instance, for people with vestibular disorders um, mm. or people with epilepsy. Um, and in this article, they kind of make the point that, um, you know, Technical users know that those features exist, but by and large, most browser users don't, right? Most people navigating the web don't. Um, and so this was a really interesting um, like case of like, hey, what if we kind of turned the narrative on its head and instead made no animation the default and let users specifically turn it on? Um, and that I think is is also kind of part of the personalization story here of making sure mm -hmm. you have sensible, accessible, out of the box defaults, and then allowing the fancy stuff for people who are willing and able to toggle that setting. 
Yeah, yeah, it's exactly that. Yeah, this is brilliant. I haven't I haven't seen this article, so I'll be I'll be reading that after this. But yeah, it's exactly that. Yeah. All right. Um Joe, this has been so great. Uh super, super glad to have you on. I've had a great time and, and also just kind of thank you for all the, the bog roll stuff. I was worried my stream was getting too professional. Um, <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Yeah, I've really enjoyed it. Um it's been fantastic to come and, and talk about it. So yeah, thank you so much for having me. Anytime. Y'all go follow Joe. I'll put his Twitter in the chat again. And also, while you're at it, go follow Semantics. Um, we mm -hmm. have some great stuff in store this month. Uh, next week, Adrian is going to be talking to us about um, test-driven development. She's a huge proponent for test-driven development. Um, and I have a lot to learn in that regard. So she's going to be talking through her process of how she builds tests and, and what that means for uh, her position on her team, uh, collaborating with other team members, collaborating via testing, which is super exciting. Um, the week after, we have my user experience partner in crime, Ashley Nelms, on. She's going to be talking about design tokens. Um, so if you're interested in kind of the design uh, uh, design library space, design system space, um, come join that. Um, and then the week after, I believe it's the 27th, we have Andy Bell, whom we referenced a couple times. We're going to be building web components together. That's going to be really exciting. And if you want to keep up with all the stuff that we're doing here, um, definitely, definitely go follow the stream on Twitter. Um, yeah. Uh, we're getting some thanks in the, the chat. Thank you all, all for, for being here. It's been, it's been killer. Stick around. We are going to, uh, we are going to raid. So let me find someone real quick. Um, yeah, there we go. Have a good one, y'all. See you next Tuesday. Peace.